my name is Major Ed Denhart, and I'm here at the West Point Museum today with the, one of our curators. Hi, I'm Wes Jensen. I'm the curator of Arms and Armor of the museum, and I have a couple items to talk about in relationship to General Gavin. So we're going to talk a little bit about General James Gavin today, more, uh, more popularly known as the Jumping General. He was the, uh, the youngest Major General and then Lieutenant General during World War II. He actually was an orphan and uh, was born in New York City. And after, uh, after a hard, hard life growing up, he decided to enlist in the Army at age 17. He served in the Army for a, a couple of years, and then he decided that he was going to get an appointment to West Point despite having been a middle school dropout. But he successfully worked hard and he was able to get into West Point with that class, uh, did wear very well for himself, and then continued on his Army career as an officer. Now, after World War II began, General Gavin, at this point, you know, more junior officer, he saw the potential for what airborne operations could do. And he was one of the individuals that literally wrote the book on airborne operations, having conducted his first jump in 1941. He was responsible for helping write the, uh, the Army's doctrine on airborne operations during World War II. And he also had the distinction of being the, uh, one of the only general officers to have conducted all four combat jumps during World War II. Uh, at Sicily, at Salerno, the jump on D-Day in Normandy, and also Operation Market Garden, where interestingly enough, uh, upon landing, he had broken two vertebrae, or, or fractured two vertebrae upon landing, but then continued his operations. A fascinating individual, and Mr. Jensen is going to tell us a little bit more about some of this equipment that Gavin would have used on these drops. Well, the airborne troops in World War II, and in, in the American Army at least, developed a lot of special equipment. They were carrying a lot that they were having to, to drop with, and they had to find ways to get it, get it to the ground and, and get it there safely. Among other things, there was a new uniform that was developed strictly for the airborne troops. And this is General Gavin's uh, coat from that airborne uniform. You'll notice the big pockets a fairly loose uh, cut to it, which was all intended to allow you to have places to put anything and everything you might think of that you would need to have in the jump. Uh, he would carry, he was known for carrying an M1 rifle, uh, the standard large rifle that many officers carried carbines, he did not. And he would have had all the, the main gear that every, every paratrooper would have. As he well knew, uh, once you put on a parachute, and you end up in, in the enemy lines, uh, and it's at night, you may not have any friends anywhere close, and so you had to have everything you needed uh, right there with you. He, uh, this is his combat uh, belt and uh, other equipment. There's a, a pistol holster there that would have carried his 45 in, uh, an aid kit pouch, and a knife. And in this case, the knife is sort of special. Uh, it's what's called a Rambo knife. And it was developed by a, a gentleman named uh, Walter Randall, Bo Randall, in Orlando, Florida. He was making high-end hunting and fishing knives before the war. And he ended up creating a knife that was made of such fine steel that it was never going to fail. Uh, they, are, they are known to be extraordinarily uh, uh, strong pieces of equipment. And uh, he did carry one. This one has his initials on it. In the world of World War II knives, this is sort of an icon for a lot of folks to have, so we're very glad to have it here at the West Point Museum. And uh, as I say, it's the thing you, you rely on when you're all by yourself. Uh, nobody's gotten together yet, and there's no telling who might be around the next corner or in the next bush. So uh, those are his pieces, and uh, they try to give a, an idea of what this man who was once an enlisted man was still thinking about as he went into combat with his troops, even as a, as a division commander. So this is one of James Gavin's personal maps that he had with him on the 19th and 20th of June, 1944. Um, and on here he put some personal notes, which include um, the location of the 505th headquarters and the position of the 507th. Um, he actually is penciled in here 82nd, um, and you can see that. And then he also penciled in um, a trail right down here. What's interesting about this map is that 
Um, it's not as detailed as other maps from World War II. So other maps would have very, very, particularly classified and top secret maps, would have very detailed information about the positions of, of German forces um, and also the specific type of weapons that they had. This is an extremely general map um, and a much more overhead view of the city um, compared to what we have in our collection here at the West Point Museum. I'm as division commander of the 82nd Airborne, as mentioned, you know, the only general officer to make four combat jumps into those areas, and he often found himself uh, by himself when he landed. And there's multiple stories of Gavin you know, moving around, collecting forces to himself, and moving out towards the objective. And also, uh, especially during Operation Market Guarding, uh, he and his Dutch liaison officer, Ari Vestergurcha, actually were directly engaging enemy forces with their own personal weapons during those combat operations. So you know, it, it's, pretty, it's, a, it's a treat and an honor to be able to see the, this equipment and know that a, a leader of that caliber was able to use these during his time in service.